it would be completely impossible to show somebody an A to Z method of creating every type of game camera out there because the truth is they're so varied. Even within one game, you could have a lot of minor variations of the same basic camera type from scene to scene or level to level or uh, any kind of different application. So what I'm going to do is show you several kind of template versions uh, of different game cameras. And you can use these as great starting points because they're going to get you 80% of the way there. And then you can just tune them for the particular needs of your game. So uh, I'm going to start out with adventure style cameras, adventure game style cameras right here. The first bit here is a kind of a fixed camera. Uh, you could call it turret style or you could call it um, kind of a security camera style. And it's going to look at things we interact with. I've already got the scene set up. Let me just show you how it works. We start off with our camera pointing at this object here. And if I click on an object, the camera will kind of drift. I've got some ease in out there. But whatever we select, uh, it's going to rotate the camera to look at. And this is a typical thing you'd use uh, if you're you know, wanting to draw attention to different things. You see this a lot in uh, many different games with people running around from different genres. And all you need to do is have clickable items. Let's take a look at what's going on with this. It's kind of devilishly simple. The uh, objects, these are all just the same cloned cube. And I just cloned this one start look so I knew <laughs> out of this list of cube where to find it. Uh, but I just rapidly did that and moved them around. And you can relocate these anywhere you want. Uh, I'm not looking at a fixed location. It, it, whatever I click on, it finds that object's location dynamically. There's the same cube, and now it'll look to where it is. So it doesn't matter where you place them, and that's great because you can move them around. You might want to programmatically have things spawn in differently depending on players' actions and all of that. What we need to do is have a camera, which is right here, and it's pretty much flat, just sitting in the world, and point it. In other words, do a look at uh, to each object you click on. Take a look at the FSMs. We'll start with an FSM I have on the main camera, and all it's doing is getting the object we click on. I start with a wait for click, and it just kind of hangs out here looking for a get mouse button down, looking for a left click event, and that's it. That's the only thing this will respond to. It just sits there silently waiting for somebody to press left click. Press any other button, nothing will happen. Only left click on get mouse button down. And when it finds a left click, it fires off this event, click check, which is right here. And again, you know, events I've set up here. I'm showing you a setup thing because you've seen me build some of these basic things over and over. So I really just want to show you some stuff how it really works. And you can stop the video and look at the details on any of these as you go. So we're not, uh, we're not skipping anything here for you in the details. When you fire off this event, we flow into this mouse pick event, this mouse pick node. And I have a mouse pick that's searching in 100. Uh, the standard distance is far enough. If you've got things really far away, you might need to increase this distance. But I've created two variables here. A did click object, which is a Boolean. I don't know if we've talked about Booleans before, but essentially it's true or false. This is going to be equal to 0 or 1, just true or false. That's the only value a Boolean, whoops, <laughs> sorry, can hold. And I've used it right here. So store did pick object. So what, it, what it's looking for is, did I click on an object or did I click out in space somewhere? For instance, uh, if we're running the game, that is a click on an object. That is a click on an object. But this, there's no object there. It's just out in the middle of nowhere. That counts as a false on the Boolean check right back here. It says, did I click on an object? No, no, you did not. It was out in space. Or yes, you did. It was a cube. And store the game object. This is a global variable that I set up. Click, clicked objects. And global variables right here. Uh, and I've got a lot from my other examples here. But clicked object, I set it up as a game object. Nice and simple. And again, I'm doing that. Sorry. That's all I need to do. You can store a lot of other things, like where's the point. Uh, if you didn't want to click on an object specifically, but say anywhere, you could uh, store it as a point instead. That's how you would do that. And so on. 
I'm storing, did you click on anything and what was it? That's really all I'm, I'm asking from the mouse pick. Did you click on something and if so, what was it? Then I immediately do a bool test. And a bool test uses that Boolean variable that we set up, did click object. I ask it to test this. And if the result is true, yes, I did click on a cube or, a, or the ground or whatever, then fire off the event send move update, which is right here. If it's false, if I did not click on a cube, if I clicked out in space, then just do a reset click, which just takes me back here and waits for another mouse click. That's the loop that goes on. Pretty easy. So you know what happens on a reset click. We just wait for another click. But let's look at what happens when we did indeed click on an object. We uh, come here to this request node, or sorry, request move node. And in this state, all we're doing is telling the camera to move. So we're sending an event to the thing that controls the camera. All right. And that is uh, an FSM I have on this game object right here. Go game object move look manager. And we'll take a look at, at that one next. But what I'm doing is sending a global event called look at. So let's take a look at where this message goes. And when it's done, by the way, it just flows back to wait for click. So when you click, it will either move the camera or do nothing. That's really what this is set up to do. So let's look at where this event goes on the, the move look manager. That, uh, well, first let's go here to the listener. This is the look at global event that we're calling from this main camera bit right here. Okay, that's the same event. We fire that off and it will flow into our look update. And once again, if you don't remember, look at is an event and you make it global simply by clicking that checkbox, global or not global. So really easy to do. Once we flow into the look update, all I'm doing is an iTween look to. Okay, nice and simple, one thing. I've chosen the main camera just by doing that. So main camera that I want to move, that's the game object I want to move. And the transform target means where, where would you like me to look? And there I passed in that clicked object. If you remember back on this other main camera, right here in the mouse pick, uh, store the game object right there. And that's why I made it global, because if it were local, it would only be available from one of these FSMs. This one needs to be a global variable so that both FSMs can see it. In fact, any FSM in the entire game could see this variable, which is pretty cool. Global object right there gets stored with the mouse pick. And this is where we use it in this other FSM. So look at the thing I clicked on. That's what we're asking it for. And I've set it to take 2.5 seconds for the time. And that means from the time or from wherever you're at to the, the place you're going to be when you get done moving, spend 2.5 seconds. That's an important number you're going to want to tune because if, you're, if your things are close together like this, it's, you know, it's going to feel like more of a, of a steep thing. There it's going to feel like you've traveled farther. And there it's going to feel like you didn't do much because they're so close. So you can really tune the number because you might find at one of these extremes, you know, it's too jerky or it just takes forever and the player doesn't really notice what's going on. Uh, that's all up to you in the tuning. That's part of the fun. And that's where you should be spending your time, not figuring out how to make it look in the first place, which is why we're using Playmaker. Time is there. There can be a delay, which if you would like it to take... Let me just add a ridiculous delay of two seconds and show you. If I clicked on something, it's going to wait two seconds and then move. If for some reason you wanted that, and you might, there might be a very good reason why you'd want that to happen. Maybe if you click on something and you want to like a little sparkly bit to play before it moves there, or, you know, players not done doing something yet. There, there could be good reasons why you'd want that. And that's where you'd do it. I'll put that back to zero. And you can adjust a lot of these. All I've done is, you've seen me do this a bunch too. I've chosen ease in out quad because it gives a nice, nice little flow to it. You can get a different response from all of these. So we just choose cubic. Let's see what it does. Just to show you. There, it's a little snappier. Like it starts slower and then kind of accelerates and then slows down again. So it's sort of fast in the middle. And you can just choose how you want your camera to behave. Uh, go ahead and try all these out until you start finding the kind of behavior you'd like. 
And loop type, you want to leave off because if you loop it, it's just going to go back and forth and back and forth. And maybe you want that, but probably not. And finally, this is really important. For a finish event, I specifically chose the finished event. It means it would flow back into something into another state if you didn't tell it to wait. And it would it could continue to move or it could give you erratic behavior. Tell it, wait until you're done moving, and then get ready to do something else. You do not want it to loop, don't finish, because then you could end up in an endless loop. So this is on by default. Make sure you check that off. If you're looking ahead a little bit, you'll notice something kind of weird I'm doing. I've got a look at event right here, and it loops back into this FSM state again. So it loops back into itself. And you might be saying, what is this about? Well, it's the same event, okay? It's the same look at event that I'm calling, which is global. And if you remember, right here, this is the listener. If I click anytime in, the, in this little scene, it's going to tell that other FSM to make a camera move, which is what we want. But what happens, let me show you. Let me just get rid of that really quick. If I didn't have that, um, delete transition, and I click on something to move, and then in the middle of the move, I click somewhere else, and nothing happens. I'm clicking a lot, and I can't get anything to happen in between. Maybe you want that. If you do, great. Uh, what I wanted, though, is to give the player a little more control so that if they clicked in the middle of a move, that it would loop them, uh, and you know, give them a new move to the new thing and stop what it was doing. I just did a really simple thing. I just Because it, it's calling the look at, right? Every time you fire the main camera click, waits for a click, goes in here, and then if it's something you actually clicked on that's valid, remember right here, it sends the look at event. If you're in the middle of a move, it's going to send the look at event again. But if you don't have the look at event in this node, it's not going to respond. It worked up here because we have the event right here ready to be heard. But without it here, like that, it won't respond to it. It'll send this and this FSM will say, well, that's great, but that guy doesn't live here, right? It's like sending mail to the wrong house. But if you add it, it will respond. And it will tell it to flow itself in here. So at that point, the clicked on object has a new value. It's not the same value anymore. So if you flow back into itself, force the iTween look to start again, it will now move to the new location, and it will start up with this time again. That is what gives me the behavior of being able to interrupt a click and flow somewhere else. Pretty cool. You can see already, there are so many decisions to make. And, you know, I've just scratched on all the options you might have. And you're going to run into these when you make your game. Uh, you'll think you've got it thought out, but you'll realize, wow, you know, I need that to be interruptible, but I don't need it interruptible there. I don't want it to be. And you may need to change these values as you go. But go for as much consistency as you can and go for as much player control as you can. And uh, your players will always thank you for it. All right, one last thing I want to show you on all this is that you can mask these things. So let's, let's go back to our uh, mouse pick, and you'll see an option here for layer mask. And what that lets you do, if you hover over, it'll tell you pick only from these layers, and it lets you specify a layer to pick. Right now we're doing this bool test just to see, did I pick an object or not? And all we're doing is saying, is it an object? In this case, you know, that would mean the cubes, and it would mean this plane. And you'll notice, when I clicked on the plane, let me do that once again. Let me get way out here, kind of sidestepping, but this is important. If I click on this very tip of this plane, right, you might think that it'll look there, but it doesn't. Instead, the camera looks to the middle. And that's because we look at the scene, and I select the plane, its origin point is in the middle. So it's really looking at the origin point of each of these objects, not the spot you clicked. So that's an important distinction. But getting back to this, if you wanted to filter, like maybe I just want it to click on the cubes and not the plane, so I don't get that weird 
point at the middle result, you know, and <laughs> confuse my player, I can set up a layer mask to only allow cubes to be clicked on. So let's pick a cube here. And uh, right up here in the inspector, I'm going to add a tag. And let's just add layer nine, I'm gonna put in cube. So we've just added a new tag, that's all there is. So we can pick a cube now, and it shows up in our list. Oh, did I not get it? Let me check that once more. Cube, layer. So where is it in my list? Oh, sorry, it's over there. I'm picking the wrong one. So you can choose cube, okay? Yeah, early in the morning, you know how things happen. So you can choose cube and specify a particular layer for that. And all this is is kind of a kind of an independent flag, right? That just says I am a cube. I have this property. It doesn't mean anything until you look for uh, look for that layer and ask it to do something specific. So let's see first of all, I set these first 3 up. Let's move one of those here where we'll be able to see it just so you don't have to watch me apply that to everything. So this right here should reply and that one not if we set this up right. So let's look once again at the main camera. And this time we're gonna do one more uh, check, layer mask, okay? We want to look for, oops, I'm sorry, we want one layer mask. And it's not asking the number of the layer here, like uh, you might get a little confused and look at add tag, it's, it's you know, use layer nine, and you might think, well, gosh, I have to, I guess I have to enter nine in that thing. That's, that's really not what it wants you to do. What it's asking you is how many layers do you want to search for? For example, that would be two. And I can pick, first of all, I can pick cube. And say if I also wanted floor, then that's how I would select it. I don't want that. I just want one. So I'll change the number of tags I want to look for to one. And I'll select cube. So now it's only going to allow anything in this layer to be selected. Otherwise, it will ignore them. It's going to mask out anything that isn't in that layer. Let's take a look. If we do this now, and look, I'm clicking on cubes and nothing's happening. But if I pick that one cube that it does have a, uh, the layer assigned, it works. And that's the only one there. So let's set up one more just to show you. I think this one was within view. So let's just tag it really quick as cube and run our uh, game again. Nothing, nothing. Response to that one. And it responds to that one. And that one had the tag on it as well, but this one doesn't. So that is how you can pick out only certain things to be clickable. Because, you know, if you have an adventure style game, you may not want the whole, uh, the whole area to be clickable. Maybe you just want certain hot spots, like, you know, in a classic adventure game, it could be the letter on the table and the exit door and, you know, some, a table or something. You can use this for security camera type things in multiple games. You can use it for, like in an architectural rendering, you could have it just allow like a whole big building, right? And it can be an invisible object that still has collision on it that you click on. So you can have things that seem fake, like maybe a big kind of fakey mask around a, a, an entire building. So it looks like you're looking at the building, but really you're just clicking on and looking at this invisible uh, polygon out there in space. So uh, play with all that, and this gives you an adventure-style look at camera to work with.